Well-being is my life. I'm focused on it every day, not just my own, but also the well-being of my colleagues at Deloitte. For me, it's a passion, a lifestyle, and it's my job. But I can tell you from experience, well-being is not always perfect. And you know what? That's okay, because it's not about being perfect. And there are times when well-being, quite frankly, goes a bit wild. And that's what we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, well-being leader for Deloitte US and your host for the Work Well podcast series. I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk about all things well-being. So important to make sure that we're not moralizing or demonizing food. And I think that unfortunately with well-being, so many people tend to like moralize what they do, right? So that if they make a great choice, that means they're good. And if they've made, made a rotten choice, it means that they're bad. And so then they go through their entire week kind of judging themselves based on those choices. If we don't moralize our food and we don't judge ourselves based on what we're doing, we can actually enjoy life. And that's an amazing concept. I'm here with Chris and Kara Moore. Both work in the well-being space like me. They both have PhDs in exercise physiology. They travel all over the world speaking on nutrition and fitness. And they also happen to be married to each other with two kids. I've known Chris and Kara for a while now. I follow them in real life and I follow them on social media. And it was actually a post that I saw on Chris's Facebook page that inspired this topic today. And so basically what the Facebook post was, was a giant bowl of popcorn. Um, and and the, the post said something like, this is what's for dinner tonight. And it was a giant bowl of popcorn. Tell me the truth as a dietitian. <laughs> did you feel bad about giving kid, your kids popcorn for dinner? You know, well, I'll be honest. I don't usually do that, but it was, it was a late night. I think I got home from traveling, hadn't seen them, and I really didn't want to make anything. And there was nothing prepared, so popcorn for dinner was it. The squeals and the voices were pretty pretty high because they're they're not quite used to that, especially coming from me. Kara sometimes does that a little more, a little bit more regularly. Hey, now. But, <laughs> but we did sit on the couch, had popcorn, and... I always remember that one meal is certainly not going to make or break you. So tell me a little bit more about popcorn because I've heard, <laughs> I've, I've actually heard differing points mm-hmm. of view and quite frankly, that's what I think makes nutrition oftentimes so confusing and so hard for people. I've right. heard that popcorn's a great snack and I've also har- heard that popcorn's a terrible snack. Right. So what's your point of view on yeah, popcorn? Popcorn can be a great snack. It's, it's, you get a ton of volume. So I mean, three or four cups easily like one serving which is a huge volume so it fills you up with not necessarily adding a lot of calories unless you're going to one of those popular shops like in the airport where they have like caramel and butter and movie popcorn that's where it gets a bad rap you make it yourself put a little we actually use coconut oil spray sprinkle a little salt on there it's a great little snack or sometimes or a dinner dinner that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so Um, You know, what I love about the two of you, or I guess one of the things that I love about the two of you, because there's a lot, um, you're you're very real and you're very authentic in terms of what you um, put out there on social media and who you are in in real life. And um, so... You know, I think there's this myth out there about well-being. I certainly hear it, feel it, see it in my role, but it's, you know, all or nothing. And so Mm. if I can't do it and I can't do it perfectly, or if I start on Monday and by Wednesday I've gone a little off track by having a a bad meal or not getting in my workout or something like that, then I just throw the towel in and, you know, say I'll start again next week. Um, can we talk a little bit about that and, and how you guys manage that in your own life? I think it's so important to make sure that we're not moralizing or demonizing food. And I think that unfortunately with well-being, so many people tend to like moralize what they do, right? So that if they make a great choice, that means they're good. And if they've made, made a rotten choice, it means that they're bad. And so then they go through their entire week kind of judging themselves based on those choices. So I think one of the thing, messages we always want to share with people is that you are not your fuel right? So you can feel your body and you can also feel good. And so if we don't moralize our food and we don't judge ourselves based on what we're doing, we can actually enjoy life. And that's an amazing concept because it brings, you know, vitality to everything that we're doing. So, so Kara, you and I have a a shared uh, (laughs) 
love for a gummy type fish that uh, <laughs> I think we have a, a love hate relationship with. Um, and, and I think we both have some pretty funny stories about, um, you know, being in an airport, being on the road, which I think is um, for people that travel a lot, especially for traveling for work. It's a challenging time for them to you know fuel their body to get the right exercise and then there is all of these options that you know and I think airports have actually done a pretty good job of of um, introducing a lot more nutritious options most lately but there are always you know those little gummy fish that seem to pop up (laughs) wherever I go call your name (laughs) they definitely call my name so what do you do how do you how do you deal with those fish talking to you (laughs) well Chris would argue that I don't allow them much in my life anymore because he saved me from my own diet choices. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to recognize that if we like something, to allow ourselves to have it. Uh, but when I started traveling a lot, what I one of the things I noticed that I would do is that I would get to this like kind of like whiny voice that would be like, oh, what was me? I'm on the road. I'm away from home. I don't get to you know spend time with my family. I have to travel for work. I have to sit with the, these long layovers. And then it would just sort of turn on this indulgent voice in my head, which would be like, I I need reward. Yeah. (laughs) What can I find? And so now when I have, you know, that voice, I listen to it sometimes. And sometimes I also recognize it for just being like, just because I'm traveling doesn't mean that I need to indulge myself. Because if travel is part of my life, it's part of my work, then I, I should take care of myself just like I would on any other work day. But... I mean, there are those times where the fish call your name yeah, and, so. and that's okay too, but I can't have too many of those because as I've, as we've talked about, you know, they can like, you just overindulge and you're like, why am I doing this? And you can't stop. And then all of a sudden you have a belly ache. And so, so what Kara is talking about is a uh, couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I was on an early morning flight and we were uh, going to the same location for the same program. And uh, it was seven o'clock in the morning and those uh, gummy fish were screaming my name and I completely convinced myself that I was going to buy a bag of them and I was just going to eat five and I was going to tuck the rest of them (laughs) away in my bag and I was going to, you know, eat five a little later or tomorrow or the next day. And so I ate the first five and then, you know, I put the little bag away and five minutes later I ate the next (laughs) five and the next five and the next five until there was nothing left in the bag. And then I sent Kara a message and I said I just want you to know that I ate the entire bag <laughs> of fish it happens right, right. So. And, and, and is it every day or no. is it once in a while right. so that, that's the important piece we always say that, that perfect is the enemy of good right so it's it's the the choices consistently versus that one choice one time or a couple times it's gonna make or break you do you feel like there are higher expectations or pressures on you to be perfect when it comes to managing your well-being in your personal lives? Do you feel like there's a, a, a constant microscope watching you? Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think, I, I, I think a lot of people do look at, look at us that way, especially for an environment where we just taught a program, for example, people are certainly looking like, what do you have on your plate? Like, is it okay? Am I kind of matching up or competing or, and, and, and the case is that it, you know, your decisions, your decisions. We'll hopefully make great decisions ourselves and hopefully guide you to do the same if we're teaching. But I think a lot of people do kind of think, like they've told us that our kids, you're, our kids are going to be so athletic because we're both in this field. That has nothing to do with anything, right? Our kids may not do sports at all. Um, so we'll hopefully guide them to make the right decisions and guide ourselves. But at the same time, we're, we're not judging what you have on your plate and hopefully not doing the same to us. Yeah, yeah. And just for the record, our oldest daughter said her favorite sport is reading. So she clearly That's will not awesome. be an athlete. <laughs> and I'm totally okay with that. Exactly. I mean, not that I have any say in it, but I'm totally okay with it anyway. So exactly. tell me about your wildest well being gone wild day. <laughs> so, you know, many, many years ago, actually, when Karen and I were dating, we would sometimes like, we both love to cook. And one time we just wanted to go like we we're she was living in Providence, a lot of great Italian food there. And we went there's this great place, a great bakery. And we thought we we're going to get a loaf of bread, get a little cheese and kind of melt it and make a great little kind of kind of snacky type dinner ish. Um, what we ended up doing is it was a big round loaf of bread. Uh, so we carved out kind of the center, almost like a soup bowl. But imagine a bigger loaf than a typical like soup bowl at a, at a store you might go to. 
filled it with with mozzarella cheese, melted it in the oven. Oh, wait, oh we God, had prosciutto in there. And prosciutto, I knew there was something else. <laughs> prosciutto there was some in there. Prosciutto as well, all layered together. And the entire loaf of bread, again, a pretty substantially large circle of bread and cheese and prosciutto all in our bellies and felt great at the time. Didn't feel so good after, but that might be one of those times when it was like, ooh, maybe that was a little bit too much. Yeah. We ate the entire loaf of bread between two people. And so I remember Chris was like all proud of himself for like making this great Italian like bread bowl. And he tells his mom and she was like, how many people did you have over? And he was like, it was just Kara and I. <laughs> so I have one question. How quickly did you eat it? It was a little more quickly than, than, than it should have been. <laughs> right. <laughs> Remember, we were sitting down in front of the TV doing everything, like distracted eating, which probably played a role in that. And maybe we were watching a movie, again, going through that bread. So I'd say maybe over that kind of two-ish hours or the length of a movie, there was a good amount of food and calories. So what is mindless eating? So in terms of mindless eating, I think so much of it is that we are just distracted constantly. And we know we, that people take in about 30% more calories when they're not paying attention to what they're eating. So if they're checking email and eating lunch or they're scrolling through their phones or they're watching television, they're going to be more tuned to like, let me just, you know, I'll finish this up on the next commercial instead of paying attention to how their body's feeling. And so they just aren't aware of how much they're taking in. So we always say that if you want to be more mindful to make sure that you go distraction free entirely, if you have somebody with you and you can have a conversation, fantastic, because then you have somebody to enjoy that experience with and you're going to be more present. But if you're by yourself, distraction free, and I always say, to try and, and make the meal last about 15 to 20 minutes if you can. It's hard. That's really hard. Mm -hmm. Really, really hard. Especially when you're by yourself. Yeah. Right. Because then you're bored and you're like, I got to, I mean, I got to finish this up. I have things to do. But, but when you do that, you can actually pay attention to how satiated you feel, how much you're enjoying the food, how the food tastes, you know, if, if, is it something that agrees with you and then how much you truly need. Yeah, and, and I've heard some, I, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. I mean, I've heard some guidance around, you know, you should chew your food 25 times, or I don't know what the, you know, what the, the guidance is. I'm sure there's no, there's different ones. But, I mean, that to me almost seems, you know, when you're talking about mindful eating and mindfulness, you know, a way of counting or a way of being present in the moment and kind of giving yourself a strategy of how to um, make that, 15 minutes actually a reality because I can't imagine sitting alone by myself eating for 15 minutes. I mean, that sounds really scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is maybe why you need to do it. <laughs> but, you know, it is interesting, the, the chewing thing. Just obviously, it slows you down. Or yeah. We always talk about ourselves and with our kids and like putting your fork down between bites or simple strategies. It is harder when you're alone and not having a, like a conversation with people or somebody. Yeah. But that's one thing that, you know, you brought up earlier, like we eat around from weddings to funerals, we're happy, we're sad, we're lonely, we're tired, we're eating for all those occasions. But one thing that, that we don't do so well, a lot of cultures do, is food is not just about fuel. Food is about the culture and the environment, rituals. the rituals. Yeah. And there's so much to it. You go to a, a many other countries and the meal can last sometimes three hours. And yeah. maybe that's not realistic every single day. But when it does happen, it's pretty cool. So could we at least, again, not look at the three-hour example, but could we at least expand our mealtime and, and enjoy food for what it is and bring people together when you're eating with other people versus just, I need to eat, get the fuel, and get back to my next task? Yeah. And one of the other things I've heard you guys uh, tell other people, give advice to, is um, treat every meal like it's fine dining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's always resonated with me just because, you know, when you are fine dining, you know, it's usually slower. Right. Um, and then the portions come out, you know, and they're, and they're smaller. And so there's something to be said, too, about um, portion size for sure. Um, and so that's always resonated with me as, as something that, that you said and that yeah. I carry with me. Yeah, good. And that's, and that's <laughs> right. so important. Again, it's, 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 you're, you're enjoying that eating occasion versus just eating fuel for the sake of, I have to eat something and it happens to be in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on um, beyond uh, nutrition. Um, obviously, that's an important component here. Um, but let's move into to other aspects of well being. Um, and, and we'll talk about one that is, uh, particularly, I think, near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is recovery, and in particular, particular sleep. I would say that 
Um, all of us in the modern world are very good at making sure we get enough stress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not so good at making sure that we get appropriate recovery, whether that be, you know, for a couple minutes throughout your day at different times or whether that's making sure that you get the appropriate amount of sleep. And so um, there's a lot of things in, in our lives and in the modern world that keep us from sleeping. Um, and, and, and so I just want to, want to talk a little bit about that because it's certainly something that, you know, if you want to talk about going wild, um, (laughs) that is, that is the wildest area of my life because, you know, I do it well for a little while and then it just goes completely wacky. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's, let's talk about that. So sleep is one of those things that I think I've become a big advocate for because I have finally realized what it means to sleep well and actually to understand how I feel when I've slept well. So for years, I would always say to Chris, oh, I'm a five-hour girl. I just need five hours. And he'd always give me like side eye, like, no, no, that's not true. And then he so, had to deal with you, right? Exactly, <laughs> right? It was, it was he, knew he, <laughs> he knew what he was getting. But um, it was one of those things that I just thought, like, I can operate. And I could operate, but I didn't know what operating effectively versus operating well versus op- operating optimally. And then so once I started dabbling in getting more sleep, then I began to realize, like, hey, I like six-hour sleep, Kara. And then I got seven hours, and I was like, wow, she's even nicer. And, you know, like eight-hour Kara is amazing because she's patient and she's calm and she's she remembers things. And she, you know, has like all of a sudden I started seeing my productivity, my focus go up because now I was rested enough and I was making better decisions for myself. So I didn't know that at five hours that I could feel that much better. But once I realized it for myself, then I thought that's something I absolutely need to protect moving forward. I think, and I think what's important about that is what Kara said is we, we don't know that we feel bad because that's just how we are every single right. day. So exploring, maybe like we've talked to people about maybe doing it for 30 days. Try like a sleep trial, so to speak. Increase it by, you know, don't go crazy. If you're five hours now, you're probably not going to go to eight or nine. Can you do a half an hour more and right. six, or 60 minutes more? And then, of course, let's certainly talk about some strategies to make that happen versus just go to bed earlier. There's lots of strategies that can make not just the sleep length increase or improve, but also the quality of your sleep as well. Yeah, but there's all of these other things that I could be getting done instead Mm -hmm. of sleeping, or I could be binge watching my favorite show, (laughs) or I could be reading a book that really has my attention, or I could be on social media seeing what all of my friends and family are up to. But instead, you're telling me I should sleep. <laughs> Remember, we're talking about going wild. Yeah. So, well, that's what I'm saying, I mean, and, and that's my version of going wild. I right, mean, you know. 9 p.m. I'm I'm out. <laughs> I'm that crazy, ride or die till 9 p.m. So when you think about it, I mean, you could be doing any of those things, and so it comes down to your own personal choice. How do you want to live your life? Yeah. And so I used to do that. Like I would say to Chris, like we just put the kids to bed. Let's sit on, you know, the couch, and we can finally it's watch time to something. go wild. Yeah. I'm like, we need to spend time together. And then I'd look over and he's half falling asleep on the couch you know we're not talking we're watching some show that I'm really not interested in and then it's just going to leave me feeling less energetic in the next the next day and less you know focused so I was like why am I making this choice when it's actually not serving my life right and so sometimes we have to evaluate that sometimes we have to put some hard rules because I'm like the rest of you know the rest of the world where if I start scrolling through social media I'm like let me see what else I can find right like yeah let's look for the next picture or the next post and that can be really addictive so sometimes you have to put some hard rules like I don't turn on electronics you know or electronics aren't on after 8 30 or 9 p.m because I am that wild but (laughs) but (laughs) and so tell me how you do that because I think that that's a huge struggle for people and Mm -hmm. so I know for for me and in my own life I mean I I the experts would probably tell me that I'm still addictive I I I have um, certainly gotten better with my electronic devices and putting rules into place for myself. But I think that that's something that not only people struggle with, but it it's, you're right, it's, it's an addiction. And so mm-hmm. it's incredibly hard to, I mean, it's almost to the point where, you know, for me, I have to give my phone to my husband and say, here, like lock it up in a safe and don't give me the code. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and even then I'm going through withdrawals. Right. So, 
Um, talk a little bit about, you know, how do you accomplish that? What does that look like? Um, and, you know, are, do you guys have any, any tips to, to help us with that? Yeah, I mean, I, it certainly is a challenge because it is addictive, yeah. absolutely addictive. So it could be something like you said, give it to your spouse and have them put it away where you don't know. Um, and it's it, like anything, like the first time, the first time that happens, it's going to be hard. You're going to be like begging and pleading and it will get a little bit easier and easier. Another strategy, and we actually heard this from a colleague um, with social media specifically, kind of similar to what you just said, um, but his suggestion, and we have actually not tried it yet, but we're going to next week. We were just talking about I it. Think, I thought you told me you were going to do we it did. like two weeks ago. You obviously <laughs> went wild. We're doing, I know. You went wild. No, but we're, we're doing it now. We're doing it. So here's what it is. You give um, somebody, a your assistant, your partner, your spouse, whoever, all your, your log out of all your social media accounts and have them reset your passwords and not tell you them. So maybe like a Monday morning, do that. And then you can't get them until Friday night, for example. So Monday through Friday, you have no option to log into any social media accounts, whatever your one is, or many are. Um, that alone, it would be hard for sure. Cause, and it's not even like, so yes, you can get distracted at night, but even just like you think about you're in the line of grocery store, you're waiting at an airport, yeah. you're I mean, just mindless things. And you realize like, how distracted someone the other day was walking his dog and I was actually, I was running and his dogs actually kind of ran into me a little yeah. bit and he was staring at his phone and then like looked up and said, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I was caught up in my phone. I'm sure he wasn't reading anything uber important, but again, we get so caught up. We don't even realize we're doing it. Yeah. So that's one strategy is give someone your accounts, have them set your passwords. Yeah, No, that's definitely happened to me. You know, you get off the elevator on the wrong floor or right. I'm mm -hmm. famous for getting in the elevator and being completely distracted by what's on my phone and not even pressing a button. Right. And I'm just standing there, not going anywhere right. Right. <laughs> until right. I realize, Oh wait, or it starts going in the wrong direction. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to go down and the elevator goes up and I'm like, wait, why am I going up? Totally. But your friend from high school is on a great vacation. You saw all those pictures. And I needed to know in that moment, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> The other thing we do is I have actual alarms on my phone to tell me to turn them off. Yeah. So to, to, to unwind, to, to plug. So I have an alarm to tell myself to get ready for bed, which has been really powerful because it's all of a sudden the reminder, like, I can't get caught up in this. I have to allow myself to make the time and, and get ready right now. Yeah. So that usually helps pull me out of the, the social media yeah. <laughs> slurp. Yeah, cycle. So – you guys are in the field of well-being. It's your job, your role to be role models for all of us, yet you're very open and vulnerable with the things that you share and the things that you post. Why, why do you feel that it's important to share those imperfect moments of your life? Yeah, and I, I think it is because obviously we're not perfect, like everyone, right? And it also it does show that vulnerability, like you mentioned. And it gets people, people like you mentioned earlier, people often look at us like, oh, it's so easy. You make all these perfect eating decisions all the time. You exercise, you know, 23 hours a day. It's so easy for you. And it's, it's, we're like everybody else. We have challenges and bumps in the road. And to be honest, when we show that, we've gotten people to be like, oh my gosh, really? You do that? Yeah, absolutely. Like we have the, the bigger responses are from when we post those real things yeah. versus the, the pretty picture with the ocean in the background and whatever else it might be. You know, there's some of those too, and those are great when it happens, but it's not real life. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. And, and just so just so all the all of you know, Chris's favorite food in the whole world is pizza, I think. Right. It, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we pizza pizza night every Friday night in our house is pizza night. And we have well, like going back to food is, is more than just eating. It's the whole culture. Yeah. So we'll roll out. the We'll make the dough first. Like the girls are involved. They're rolling the dough. They're mixing the yeast, all that stuff. There's so much around it. And if we if there's a night we don't have it. Our girls are asking, like, why aren't we having pizza tonight? It's, it's Friday. And we love that. Like, that's, yeah. that's like, as they grow up, hopefully that continues to be a part of our culture and family. Yeah, great. So let's move on and talk a little bit about um, movement and exercise. I mean, exercise doesn't have to take a lot of time. And we were just talking a little bit earlier about, you know, your, your workout today, Chris, was 10 minutes because right. you had to get on a call and that was all you had. So, Kara, right. I'll turn it over to you. What about you guys? All right. Well, we know that if exercise were a pill, it would be the most widely prescribed and also addictive drug known to man because of how it makes us feel. We have those endorphins flying after we've exercised. I mean, no one walks away from a workout and was like, man, I wish I didn't do that, right? Because we feel so good and then we have that, that sense of confidence and, and empowerment. 
But then it's also impacting every cell in our body. So it is really a powerful thing. And I think what trips people up is they have a story around exercise. So, so often I see people have this mindset of, well, I used to do this. Or when I was in the best shape of my life, working out took me an hour and a half and I don't have 90 minutes. So therefore I don't work out. And I think we always have to kind of look at that story and say, how is that story shaping our current behavior and how do I change it? You know, I always use this, the motto of like, what do I have time for today? And so my goal is to move every single day. And ideally I would love to go to the gym and be able to get a great workout in and do some resistance training. But it also can look like I'm going to get a 10 minute walk in before I pick the kids up at the bus stop. And that's good enough too. So if I look for opportunities for movement rather than defining what it should look like, I can always make it happen. Tell me about a time when one or both of you, or perhaps as a collective unit have fallen off the wagon or gotten into a rut yourself. Um, and, and what, what was, what was your approach to kind of getting back on track? Or maybe if your approach to getting back on track was less than optimal, what would you do differently now? Mm -hmm. When I think about my own ruts, I think I have a tendency. And I mean, I've been working with individuals for the past 20 years to help people change their habits. And I am a classic all or nothing person. So one of the things I tend to notice about myself is when I feel like I'm slipping, I mean, I might still get some exercise or movement into my diet still, you know, relatively clean, but I'm just kind of moving away more frequently um, from the principles I like to live my life by that I tend to try and start to plan like, oh, next week, you know, when all this travel ends, then I'll get, you know, five days in a row of hitting the gym hard and, and cleaning up my diet. And so I tend to find myself trying to plan for that. So the one thing I always tell all of my clients is that you just have to do something. Take action. It can't be perfect. It shouldn't be perfect, but just do one thing. And so rather than thinking like, I'm going to wait for January 1st before I really clean up my diet and pay attention to my well-being, do something today. What is it that you can do? Can you do 10 push-ups before you go to bed tonight? Can you make sure that you're drinking some more water? You know, what is that one thing that you can take action on right now? Yeah, and and I think there's some some things that, that I've definitely learned and that, that I talk about probably pretty frequently um, is, you know, for me, I, you know, and, it, and somehow everything always goes back to food. I, you know, I don't know why, but, <laughs> us but, but you know, ma- making sure that I am actually fueling my body throughout the day so that it is helping maintain and, and sustain me. Um, and I'll get going and get focused on something or be on back to back calls. And I will simply just, I don't know if it's forgetting to eat, but I'm just too busy to mm-hmm. eat, you know? And so I have scheduled time on my calendar. If you look at my calendar, it says breakfast, snack, lunch, <laughs> snack, dinner, snack, bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I guess we, we talked about, you know, technology and, and, you know, the things that kind of distract us, but that's in my own way, a way to um, use the technology that's at my disposal to also remind me and enhance, you know, my, you know, my tendency to, forget to eat, I guess, if you will, and instead use it to kind of prompt me or nudge me like, hey, it's time to it's time to eat or you're going to become hangry and nobody yeah. likes Jen when she's hangry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you bring up a great strategy because we schedule so much else in our lives, yeah. right? We have these meetings from this time to that time and that's all scheduled and back to back, but we never do that with exercise and nutrition, yeah. right? So if you have that in place, like just like any other appointment, yeah. take full advantage. So maybe it's you block out a certain time for exercise or like you said, now's my breakfast, lunch, whatever time, but making time for that is important. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about meditation. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. My favorite topic. <laughs> meditation. I mean, we, it, it has become kind of the, the buzzword around corporate America and, and well-being. It has made its way into mainstream, if you will. Um, it is something that, again, I um, am always trying to evolve my fledgling practice. <laughs> um, it, it always seems to be a fledgling practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know there's some things in there around judgment and you just need to just do it and get over it and, and stop thinking about the fact that you're thinking um, and punishing <laughs> yourself for it. So. Isn't it so easy? <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that's just it. I mean, I think, again, when we talk about kind of myths around different aspects of well-being, 
um, you know, with meditation, people feel like, oh, I can't do it because I can't sit still. I can't clear my mind. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. We, we come from it from a complete place of I can't. And if I spend time meditating, then, you know, I could be doing all of these other things. Right. So I know this is a topic that, uh, that you have some great stories around. And so I'd love for you just to share that with us. Great. Um, so meditation is one of those things. It is a practice. And that's, I think, one time uh, something that everyone forgets. Because once they start to meditate, they want to know that they're doing it well, right? So then that all automatically brings in this layer of judgment that says, am I doing this right? How am I doing this? Wait, what am I thinking? Why am I thinking? You know, and all of a sudden, we get carried away with our thoughts. And so therefore, we feel like we're not doing it. So we give up. But it's simply the, the practice of just saying, oh, I'm thinking again and returning back to our breath. Um, meditation for me has been so powerful because I, uh, used to be a person who was highly attached to expectation. Um, (laughs) I just looked at Chris. You guys can't see them right now, but they're giving each other a look. (laughs) The eyebrows raised. Yes. They used to be. (laughs) Um, and so whenever I'd be in the middle of of an experience, whether I'd, I'd be facilitating a group, whether I'd be, you know, having a dinner party at my house, I could never enjoy it because I was always judging how well it was going, right? I was always noticing the things that weren't right about the the experience. And then afterwards, I would sit there and just ruminate over yeah. the fact that like it didn't go perfectly. And so um, I had had friends who were meditating there, you know, and I started noticing the changes in them. And some of my friends who I associated with like high anxiety or always like having these really high expectations. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll give it a whirl. So when I first started meditating, of course, I was like, monkey mind, I can't do this. And then I just gave in and said, I'm going to allow myself time to do this. Um, And at first, I was, you know, really kind of inconsistent with my practice. And then I started putting it first thing in the morning. Um, And our kids are early morning people. So they wake up early. And we do too. And I, I... you know, there's something about my children knowing that like my body must have changed positions or my breathing's different. Like they, they can sense the second I'm up. So I would like stealth mode, go into the living room and try and be like as quiet as possible to meditate. But inevitably I'd hear them. And so it would interrupt my practice and I'd be like, I can't do this. So eventually I started getting like Bose headphones and like really trying to block out all signs, you know, making this a really quiet experience. So one day... Um, I had like my headphones and I could still hear my child coming in the room and like she, you know, comes in the room and all of a sudden like, you know, she's like, mommy. And I'm like, what? I'm meditating. Like I'm like completely anti-zen, you know, yell at her, go back to bed, like getting all upset. And I'm like, what is the purpose of this? Right. (laughs) And so now I've realized that meditation is all about those interruptions. It's about the real world and you can't have a perfect practice. You can't make it so that it's going to be this ideal Zen environment, but it's just simply giving yourself time to return to your thoughts So that you can get the benefit of clearing your mind and allowing your mind to focus on whatever you want it to rather than being interrupted constantly by sounds, thoughts, other people, and so forth. And and all of this is, um, I mean, because it it sounds good, right? It sounds great. Um, (laughs) But but why? I mean, what? I mean, there's so much science behind it now that's coming out. And so if you want me to do this I need to know why because I could right. be spending my time doing something else yes. So tell me the why so they've they've shown that meditation people who re- meditate on a regular basis have um, lower stress they have higher happiness they have a higher sense of self-confidence and um, an acceptance in their life they've it's decreased blood pressure it decreases sleep medication and improves cardiovascular health And it changes neuroplasticity in the brain, which means that we adapt to learning faster. We have better memory and retention. We make better decisions when we've meditated. And I think it's that it takes out that reactivity that we tend to have. So when we react to a situation or we allow our emotions to take over, that's really our amygdala and our brain, kind of like our reptilian brain saying like, I have this feeling and I need to react to it. But what meditation allows you to do is recognize that that's just an emotion or a feeling and that we can return to rational thinking by naming it, by recognizing that just because I'm feeling this way does not mean I have to respond or Or that it's even reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or that it's going to last forever. You know, it's a, it's a passing emotion just like a cloud passes. And so if I just wait for it to pass, I won't feel this way forever and I don't have to respond and react to it. 
So meditation is really a magic pill. It <laughs> is. It's a cure-all. It is <laughs> the best pill. It's absolutely free. It has zero side effects. Yeah. I, I think an important piece too is when we think about meditation, people often get overwhelmed. Yeah. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes, 60 minutes. I was going to ask that next. Yeah. Like what is the optimal time to meditate? Whatever time you're willing to give it, yeah. just okay. consistently. So I would say it's not about an optimal time. It's about creating a practice that allows you to do it day in and day out. So if that means two minutes, great. And it doesn't have to be at the same time every day or just whenever you can fit it in. No, anytime we take a habit and we put it in at the same time every day, it makes it more ritualized, which means that we're more likely to do it. But if you can fit two minutes in the morning and then two minutes the next evening, it's all good. Right. And again, it's not about being perfect. Right. Perfect. Sometimes it's, it's about being good. wild. Progress, yeah, exactly. not perfection. <laughs> I'm so grateful Chris and Kara Moore could be with us today to discuss well-being. Thank you to our producers and you, our listeners. You can find the Work Well podcast series on Deloitte.com or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword well-being to hear more. If you have a topic you would like to hear on the Work Well podcast series or maybe a story you would like to share, reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jennifer Fisher or at Twitter, at JenFish23. We're always open to recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thanks, and be well. Be well.